Now the project's name uh, is new since we were here last. Um, it's named in honor of Linwood Dunham, who served as head farmer at Ram Island Farm in Cape Elizabeth from 1929 to 1971. Mr. Dunham was known for his farming skills, horsemanship, and his generosity, sharing his knowledge with many other Cape farmers during that period. For many, many years, Mr. Dunham held the Boston Post cane as Cape Elizabeth's oldest citizen. He died in 2000 at age 108, at which time he was the second oldest living Mainer. Um, next slide, please. So this is an aerial view of the site, which I don't think we showed you when we were in front of you last time. Um, and um, Kristen, if you can just indicate with the cursor where our building is, it's probably obvious, but right there at the back of the new village green. Um, and you, you can see um, the, the parking that's about on the left-hand side would all be dedicated towards uh, our, our project. Um, and then um, you can see uh, the, on, just to the right of our, of our proposed building is the building that Dr. Jacobson has gotten approval for to build his, his dental office with a few apartments above. Um, you can also see how much wooded area there is behind us, providing a really nice buffer for the project from the, the residences which are in, in, behind us. You can also see how the footprint of our building would not be all that different in scope in, in sort of order of magnitude from a lot of the building's footprints in the area, such as Town Hall um, there on the left, uh, the, the police station directly across from the Village Green, the fire station, uh, near the police station and of course, Pond Cove, um, which you can only see part of there, but it has a, a very large footprint. Um, so um, I think let's go to the next slide. The next slide is kind of a, a much closer up. So this is as if you were walking towards the dental office on the right and our proposed building is in the rear there. And, and this, this slide kind of shows what we're trying to do architecturally, which is to use very traditional Cape Elizabeth building forms with gables and dormers and um, a, a pitched roof, um, clabbered siding, um, and, to, and breaking down the size of the building um, by having the facade move in and out um, forward and back uh, to create the, the feeling of, of two buildings that are kind of connected in the middle by that connector um, with the gray connector. Uh, at the top of the connector would be the roof deck that would overlook the village green and then one level below that would be the fitness center for residents. And then the two levels below that would be a two level eight entry atrium. Um, so um, the next slide is a, a rough floor plan of, um, so that you can see how the building would be laid out. And this is a first floor plan. So um, it's got some things on it that the upper floors would not have. So when you come in where Kristen's cursor is, um, there's the two story atrium. Um, with an elevator there. And then right behind that is the community room with a laundry room off, the, off to the left of it. And then two offices for our staff to the left of that. Um, and then the rest of the floor is all apartments, except for the far right in the rear, um, that, that the part where the cursor is now would be bike storage with its own entrance and exit out, onto, out, out to the outdoors. And then behind that would be a mechanical room. Um, and you can, and then, on the, on the upper floors, it would basically be all apartments. Um, but you can see here how we've, what we worked with our architect. We, we heard a lot of comments, such as from the gentleman this, who spoke this evening about, can't you, can't you add some multi-bedroom units to the mix? And initially we thought we couldn't because of the, the tight site constraints, the size of the site. But in working with our architect, we were able to kind of add some, some very small wings there in the rear um, where you can see that in the rear, the building kind of sticks out a little bit more than it does in the front. And that was, we, there we were able to, to sort of pull open a couple of one bedroom units and make them wide enough to become two bedroom units. Um, and you can see there on the far left in the rear is one of them. And then on the right, the second to the rightmost that, in that space there. Um, so um, we're very happy that, that we're able to um, to add, to add some multi-unit uh, apartments, which will provide that, that some children could live there. Um, next slide. So this is a, a slide about parking. Um, and 
initially we were we were thinking that we were proposing the, the 34 spaces which which are on um, in Dr. Jacobson's subdivision that come along with the two lots that we have under contract. Plus we were gonna ask to share 15 spaces in the existing town hall lot, um, which seems at least when I've been there to, to not be fully utilized um, for a total of 49 uh, parking spaces for 49 units. But that was when it was all one bedrooms. Once we went to eight two bedrooms, we realized we would need more parking than that. And so we had our civil engineer look at um, adding parking in the rear of the existing town hall lot on town land. The town actually owns quite a bit of land back there where the recycling boxes bins used to be and where there's a temporary um, uh, skating facility right now. Um, and so Kristen, can you show with the cursor where the edge of the existing pavement is? It's right there. So everything to the right of that um, could be made into 34 additional parking spaces, which we would be willing to pay for. Um, and because it's on town land, we would share those spaces with the town and it would just be sort of first come first serve. So um, that would be 34 plus the 34 that we have on our own land um, which would be 68. And we're very confident that that would be enough for 49 apartments based on the utilization we have in other projects and even accounting for the fact that there's less, well, that there's no public transportation in this, in this area. Um, but the, the current zoning does require 1.5 parking spaces for every one bedroom unit and 1.75 for every two bedroom units. And if we could go up, that would, that would require us to have 76 spaces for 49 units. So if we shared eight spaces in the among the existing town hall spaces, that would get us up to up to that number, 76. Um, so next slide, please. So this is a slide about the TIF. And one thing that we're really happy about is that um, we've been able to reduce our TIF ask from 65% of the additional new property taxes raised by this project, all of, the, all of the property taxes that are being currently collected on the current site continue to go 100% to the town in a TIF arrangement. But of the new additional revenue that, that of property tax revenue, we were, the TIF ask has gone down from 65% to 45%. And the reason for that is that there was a change that Congress made to the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Program as part of one of the recent uh, stimulus plans that came out of Washington. It was the one that was signed by President Trump right at the very end. He was undecided about whether to sign it, but he did sign it. Uh, one of the last things he did as president. And in, in that very complicated bill was a, a, a fix to a problem in the affordable housing tax credit, which has essentially makes it more valuable. Um, and so you can see in this pie chart on the left, that was what the pie chart looked like when we were in front of you last. And the green piece of pie was the amount of, of money we could raise from selling those tax credits, which was at the time 28% of the total project cost, but has now gone up to 33%, which means that we can ask for less, less of a TIF. Um, and so we're really, really happy about that. Um, let's see. Um, Nathan, did you did, did you want to reiterate to um, I, I don't know if you have it on a subsequent slide here, but I know I remember you'd mentioned at a previous meeting and workshop about um, unlike some other development projects where that TIF is going towards and and the, and the nature of meeting you've got it right. here on the slide as part of the pie, but maybe yeah. if you just want to expound upon that a little bit. Sure, exactly. So. The, the, the purpose of the TIF is to help us close a gap in the financing um, where our sources of funds available to the project don't quite meet the, the costs of the project in terms of construction costs and the other costs. And so by having that revenue stream coming back to us from the town, it allows us to take out an additional mortgage, which pays for that, which closes that gap. And the gap was 7% of the total project cost. It's now 5%. So instead of taking out something like a $700,000 mortgage, we take out a $500,000 mortgage. And all of the funds that we collect from the town goes to pay that extra mortgage from Maine State Housing Authority. So none of it goes to our pockets. It all goes to paying for the cost of building the project. 
And a, a couple of other points about the TIF. Um, so we estimate that the added taxable value from this project would be about $78,400 a year. That's based on how much property taxes we pay in other communities. Um, and sort of, it's sort of an average um, per unit property tax. So if, if, if our tax bill in CAPE would be, is, would be similar to what we pay in other communities, um, it would be about $78,400 um, of added tax value on top of the, the taxes that are being collected on this site currently. Um, so 55% of that, um, that that you guys would, would that the town would receive would be $43,000. So day one, the town would get $43,120 more in taxes from those two lots than they are collecting now, than the town is collecting now. Um, and that's a, it was when we were here last and we were proposing that only 35% of the taxes would go to the town. That would have been 27,440. So it's gone up from 27,000 to 43,000, which is a 57% increase. So we're very pleased about that. And we can thank the US Congress. Um, now, um, next slide, please. So this is about commercial space. Um, we, have, we have reviewed many financial scenarios trying to find one where we can build this with commercial space on the first floor. And we just have not been able to find one. Um, the, the problems are number one, commercial space just doesn't bring nearly as much, doesn't fetch nearly as much revenue per square foot as housing does. Even, even the housing that we're proposing, which is, is low cost. Um, and, and the other problem is that there's so much commercial space available right now. The, the area is awash in commercial space not only at the main mall and at Mill Creek and everywhere else you look nearby, but right, right there in, in the Cape Elizabeth town center, there's the, there are two spaces in Pond Cove that are currently empty. Um, there's one that seems underutilized. And then there's the, I think it's a former bank building at the corner of, um, of Route 77 and Shore Road, which is empty. Um, and so, so, we, we have a really hard time believing that we could rent that space anytime soon. Uh, we think it would be years before we rented that space and we just can't attribute any income to it when we're doing our pro forma budgets. Um, another problem with it is that it, because it would be raw space, that space that had never been built out to be a commercial, you know, a doctor's office or a, a restaurant or, 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 or a coffee shop or whatever, it would be a lot more expensive to build it up to that point than it would be to go into a, a previously used commercial space. So um, a, an entrepreneur who was looking at locating somewhere would be less likely to choose our space because there would be a lot more fit up costs than there would be say in going into one of the Pond Cove spaces that was recently a, a restaurant or, or an office. Um, so demand for commercial space is very weak right now, um, partly because of what's happened to retail as a result of e-commerce, um, Amazon and the like, and partly because of what's happening to office space right now because of, what, of the response to COVID and how work has changed in the last year. Um, so um, what we think that would be the best way that we could support the town center would be to, to add people. Um, and, and, and some of the comments alluded to this from the public, um, adding residents in that area who can walk to the commercial spaces that do exist, um, to Pond Cove, to Sea Salt, um, and the other areas near the library um, and, and, and heading north towards, towards Portland, um, would give those spaces, would animate those spaces and give them the best chance to come back alive. Um, also, we wanna point out that um, that if we were excused from, if, if the town uh, adopted a zoning amendment, which, which didn't require us to provide commercial space because we're so set back from the road, um, the, the, the amendment, the way it was written that the planning board was considering said that for lots more than 200 feet back from a road um, and which are providing at least 36 units of affordable housing that's kept affordable for 45 years, would be excused from that requirement. If, if that were adopted by the town, you would still have lots one and two, the lot, the lot that, that 
Dave Jacobson is building his dental practice on, and then the lot that's even closer to the road from, from that. So there would still be commercial space in that subdivision. It just wouldn't be in every single one of the lots. Um, so um, we, we're also concerned about the potential impact on the town center of, of long vacant commercial space there. Um, it can become an eyesore if it's vacant for a really long time. And the, the longer it remains vacant, the harder it is to rent it because it, it can get a reputation as sort of dead space. Um, one other um, kind of just a data point for you. Um, someone, who, someone who wrote into the planning board um, was actually the, the leasing agent for um, retail space that's been, been built at Thornton Heights Commons, which is a brand new affordable housing project on Route 1 in the Thornton Heights neighborhood of South Portland. Um, and that was required by the city to have commercial space on its ground floor. Um, and Brandon Mitchell, that leasing agent, wrote a letter to the Cape Planning Board during, during these recent meetings in which he said that in the two years that that space has been offered for lease, he hasn't received a single inquiry about it. Um, and that's right up at the street, right on Route 1. Um, and our space would be set back 320 feet from Route 77. So um, next slide. OK, this I'm going to turn it over to Kristen, who's really done this analytic work to, to take us through this slide. Thanks, Kristen. Sure. So just hearing the importance of commercial space with the planning board, we've looked at sort of so many different scenarios trying to find one that would work. And these are just two of the scenarios um, that we outlined for the planning board that sort of explain what causes issues with our financial model when you add commercial space. Um, so in this first scenario, we created two 1900 square foot commercial spaces in the front of the building, um, which means losing six apartments, um, three on each side of the main entry would be eliminated to create that space. And by eliminating apartments, we saw a reduction in the amount of subsidy that we would get for main housing, as well as the amount of equity that we could get for the sale of the tax credits in the amount of $540,000. Um, we also, because of the reduction in income, when you eliminate apartments, we had a reduced capacity to take on debt in the amount of $445,000. Um, of course, the commercial space is much cheaper to construct because it's not finished in the same way that the apartments are. So there was a reduction in the construction cost of $575,000, but all said and done, there was a financial gap in this version of about $400,000. But in this scenario, the biggest issue was that because we reduced the apartments, but the construction cost doesn't go down, um, there are so many fixed costs in construction that don't reduce when apartments go down. Um, we were exceeding the development costs that's allowed by main housing. And so we wouldn't be eligible to apply through main housing for funding for this scenario. Um, so then we, obviously that shows that if we lose apartments that the scenario doesn't work. So we created a second scenario where we assumed we could get the same two 1900 square foot commercial spaces, um, but that we would find somewhere else to fit the apartments. Um, that showed there was no change in the subsidy or equity because the apartment count was the same. Um, and there was a small increase in our capacity to take on debt because of the income from the commercial space of about $448,000. But there was also an increase in construction cost of $600,000 to create that commercial space. Um, so that created a gap of about $250,000 between the sources and the expenses. The biggest limiting factor aside from the financial gap in this scenario is that the site is very physically confined by the wooded buffer that's in the back and then the property lines on both sides um, that I'm not really sure that we could physically relocate six apartments. Um, in order to do that, it's likely that we would have to go up a fifth story, um, which would maybe look out of place in the area. Um, it would cause the building to be taller than the trees that are behind it. Um, and that would be very evident. And we just wanted to point out that we have created a website just to help people from the community to learn the, you know, the facts of the proposal. Um, so people can go to dunhamcourt.com if you wanna read about the specifics of what we're proposing, all the information is there. 
And then this is our contact info, which is also on the website um, and people can feel free to reach out with any questions. So thanks, Kristen. So to, just to wrap up, um, since we were here last, we have added eight two bedroom apartments to the mix um, so we can have more diverse family configurations, um, including some families with children. We've increased the available parking. Um, we've reduced our, our TIF need substantially. And we've also, and I didn't mention this earlier, but we've also clarified that, that this housing will be available to all ages. At the time when we were in front of you in early February, we were still working on that with our seller, but we worked that out. And so this now will be available to all ages. Um, so we would really love to partner with the town on this project. Um, we think it has real public benefit, um, but we need to have, we feel like we need to have an honest conversation with you, the town council about, about it. Um, the, we've, been in, we've been in front of the planning board three times now. Um, there've been three meetings um, at which they've discussed the, um, the pr a proposed affordable housing amendment to the town center zone. Um, and they took a straw poll uh, after the third one, um, the most recent one. And the result of the poll was that three of the four zoning adjustments that would be needed in order for this project to work received support, received majority support. But a fourth one, the one about the commercial space, uh, failed on a three to four vote. So it was a very close vote. Um, in other words, four members were not willing to, to waive the commercial space requirement for the first floor. Um, and and in, in, that, in the discussion, it, it, it seemed to us as though at least some of the planning board members felt, felt uncomfortable making such a, even voting on such a large policy issue as, as to whether a project of kind of of this importance and, and size should go forward in, in Cape. They, they seemed to feel as though that was more of a town council decision. It was kind of a high level policy decision, whereas their role is more to, um, to, to implement zoning that, that has, that's on the books uh, rather than to make large policy calls about, about what zoning should be. Um, so because of that, and, al and also, but mainly because the way it, it, things are going in the planning board right now, we wouldn't be able to do this project. Um, and we're spending a significant amount of time and effort and, and, and frankly money on it um, each month. And we really kind of need to, to know, we know that you, the town council are the ultimate decision makers, not the planning board. And we just kind of wanted to get a pulse from you about what you're thinking, whether you're thinking this is something that you, you are gonna want or, or not. Because if, if you're thinking it mirrors the planning board's thinking, then we really should probably pull up stakes and, and work on other opportunities in other communities. Um, so that's, that's really why we're here. We just wanted to hear your thoughts at this stage um, and whether, we're, whether we should continue down this path or whether it's, it's, it's ultimately not, not gonna work. Thank you. Thanks, um, Nathan and Kristen. Um, you know, appreciate the detail and um, you know, sort of picking up on your last comment. You know, also appreciate the amount of of that time and, and effort that you all have put into this. Um, it's clear from um, you know following along on this that um, you've certainly you know been hearing and been receptive. To a lot of the comments that are being offered, um, either by the public or by the planning board or by this council, um, in a way that um, you know I, I don't think um, you know is is necessarily um, you know standard or or, or commonplace on, on on the part of developers. So um, certainly appreciate um, you know how how you all have worked to 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 try and make this work um, you know as reasonably as possible. Um, I, I do want to just um, do two things. Number one, we, we've got still about 15 folks in the audience, and I don't know if we want to uh, real quick try and try and hit the the folks that we we're having some audio trouble with before. Um, Kristen, did you have something you want to add? Um, I just want to say that I think Greg Bolas is calling in on his phone. So if okay. you unmute that phone number instead of him on Zoom, it might work. Oh, because he can't raise his hand. 
right. on that then. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a couple other folks too. So I do see a phone number in the queue. Um, why don't we go though, try and go back to Moira Kincannon, Matt, um, and see if we can't get her and, and run through these couple um, before we get into a broader discussion. So Moira, Matt's going to open up your microphone in just a minute. We'll see if we can make this work again. And your, your microphone should be live now, Moira. You might, again, have to unmute on your own end, but... How about now, Moira? Oh, I think I heard something. Maybe not. Maybe that was somebody else shuffling papers. Moira, I'm terribly sorry. I don't know what the trouble is with the with the connection. Um, I uh, if if we're not able to figure it out, I just uh, ask that if, if you've got comments, welcome you to email the council, um, and we'll be happy to take them into consideration. I see Mike and Cannon also um, in the queue, so maybe we've tried to establish on a different connection. We'll, we'll get to Nat Jordan first. Who's next? And Nat, you Go ahead, be... Nat. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Go ahead. Your uh, uh, address, please, if you don't mind. I'm Nat Jordan. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a college student, so I'm out of state right now, but I live at, my parents live at 6 Robin Hood Road. Um, I'd like to add my voice as a young person who kind of, I'm, I'm one of the targets, I think, of this project. Um, I'm about to graduate college and I'm looking, you know, to move back to the Portland area. And the housing market is just, or the at least renting market is is brutal. And my hometown Cape is not doing enough to relieve that pressure on the, on the housing crisis. And so as someone who does wanna move back to perhaps a, a, an apartment complex like this, uh, we need to go forward with, with this project so people like me uh, can move to the Portland area. I mean, Maine has a young person problem and this is one of the things, this is one of the reasons why we have that young person problem. Um, just two more quick points. Uh, on the retail aspect, for the 20 years I've lived in Cape, Town Center and specifically the shopping center, the Pond Cove uh, Center, have always been revolving doors in terms of retail, um, even in the best of times. I mean, Cumbies saw, sat empty for years. I believe Key Bank is still empty. And so we should not be building more retail when we can't even fill the available spots that we have. I think that and I think that's because we don't have enough housing and, and housing that is walkable to town center. Those are reasons why we can't fill those spaces. Housing is a prerequisite for retail. So we should focus on housing first. And if housing works, then let's move towards, re towards retail. Um, finally, I think that parking should not be a barrier. Um, I'd urge the council to not even initially build those 34 additional spots. I'd urge the council to stick with the town hall parking lot, the shared parking, and then see if we need more. Because a lot of these, like, like the developers have said, a lot of these uh, citizens are going to be older people um, who may not use cars. We should build the town center to be a walkable, bikeable place and not focus on cars. Um, so thanks for your time. Thank you, Nat. Um, good luck with the rest of your semester. Um, Matt, do you want to try and go to, uh, yeah, I, it looks like you're Pull up Mike, and then we'll try and get Greg's phone there. So um, Mike Kincannon is next. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Oh, sorry about that. I was I didn't bring my laptop home, and I was going on my daughter's computer, so I apologize. Um, no I worries. Just, go ahead. Yeah, I would just. I live at 29 Old Colony Lane in Cape Elizabeth. I also own Sea Salt Gourmet Market in Cape. And I would just uh, like to rate, give my support for the project. I think his buildings that I've seen in Portland are really nice. And I just really realize how many people need uh, places to live in Cape. I have three employees who are single in their 20s who would love to live in Cape and just can't afford it at this point. So, I would just like to really endorse the project and I think it would be great for the town. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for your patience with the, um, with the Zoom too. All right, uh, go to the phone number that I assume is Greg Bolas. Uh, Matt is gonna 
activate that line in a second, Greg. Should be live on our end, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I think we're. I think Can you we're hear me now? now, Greg? Go ahead. Awesome. Yep. Thanks for Fabulous. your patience. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Uh, yeah, my name is Greg Bolas. I live at Nine Maiden Cove Lane in Cape. Been here for 30 plus years. Um, I support this project. I don't have any dog in the hunt, but I think it's good for the town. Um, just by way of background, um, I'm a senior partner at the Bolas Company. We're a commercial real estate firm, and we've been developing and leasing retail for 45 years and have done a number of projects in Freeport, retail projects in Freeport, retail projects around the main mall. So I, I think I know a little bit about retail. And um, I think this project is great, but the retail on the first floor is kind of a non-starter. And the worst thing that a town can have is vacancy on a first floor. Um, we already have some of that in town. If you add uh, Dunham Court with retail on the first and have vacancies there, it's, it's just a, it's an awful look for the town. And being 300 feet or whatever it is back from the main road, um, given the demographics of the town and given the fact that most people shop at Mill Creek who live in Cape, it, th that space just isn't going to fill anytime soon. And I, and I hate to see a successful project dragged down by those vacancies. Um, it's just going to be very, very difficult to fill. Um, Retail needs exposure, which that space doesn't have because it's set so far back. And um, I think it's a great project, but I encourage you to stay away from the uh, retail component of that. And uh, that's about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Is there anybody else from the public that would like to speak on this at this time? Again, the, there's going to be a public hearing that was referenced um, that the planning board will be holding uh, later this month. So certainly more opportunity for folks to weigh in, um, but uh, just for the sake of tonight's meeting, if there's anybody else that wishes to speak, now's your chance. I don't see any hands raised. Um, so, um, you know, Nathan, um, I, I appreciate also you know, the, the forthrightness, which you're sort of stating your purpose here tonight um, and appreciate uh, the sort of fork in the road that you all are at. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll use that as the, the gateway into the conversation with the council um, to, um, you know, sort of, you know, get a sense of opinion and things like that. I think um, just to set up that discussion, I, I assume that most, if not all of the council has, um, you know, followed this along to some degree, um, hopefully watched um, uh, recent planning board workshops and things like that. I was asked to join the planning board a couple of workshops ago um, to try and provide some clarity and interpretation of the charge that had been given to them. And um, uh, I think in some ways I, I added some clarity and probably in some other ways I might have added some confusion for them, so, which was not my intent, but what I did take away from that, though, was um, something that was, I think, touched on in in Mr. Zanton's remarks about um, sort of whether you want to call it apprehension or confusion around the distinction between the planning board's role as an interpreter and an in implementer of ordinances and regulations and the council's role in setting policy um, and 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 um, you know, sort of giving the guidance and direction on um, what we interpret as as what's in the best interest of the town. Um, so that was number one. Is that I, I felt you know through their questions and through the the course of the discussion that was had at the meeting that I attended, this sort of tension um, that they were clearly struggling with, and I I, I sense from votes that are four three and three four that that that's consistent with that view. Um, the second thing I wanted to add is, um, I think, uh, you know, from, from public comment from some people that I've heard from or, or we've collectively heard from either in these forums or in emails to us and, and things like that, um, is this question of the tension that exists between an existing uh, town center plan, which is now, I think, roughly about a decade old, give or take, um, which is what sort of laid out the um, 
the requirement or the the intention of having uh, first floor commercial space as part of a, a broader mixed use uh, vision for the downtown area and the town center district versus the more recent um, comprehensive plan, which I think has um, appropriately highlighted uh, some of the deficiencies in both housing stock, um, affordability of housing, things like that, and specifically made note of the fact that forward-looking changes will, will need to be considered and contemplated in order to accommodate some of the things that were identified as um, sort of problems needing solving uh, as a result of that document. So again, you, you know, you've got these, these two plans that, that folks spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of energy working on, and um, it's not, uh, I'm not suggesting in any way that um, one should be just set aside or tossed or, or anything like that. But clearly, there's a bit of tension um, that's existing with those two things, because in some ways, um, those two things are, are somewhat contradictory um, to one another. And then I think there's the, the, the last thing I'll just point out is the, the reality that has been, I think, hit on a few times tonight as well, either by the, by the developers or, or other members of the public that have been speaking, which is, does that vision that the town center plan envisioned, you know, roughly a decade ago, um, you know, in practice, if that hasn't come to viability and fruition as a function of the, you know, the, the conditions of the marketplace, well, you know, is that really a vision that is worth um, sort of clinging to and holding on to um, if, as a matter of practice, it's not being met or fulfilled or realized? Um, because of, of what the market will bear. So anyway, that's, that's sort of my frame up of, of how I see this. Um, and um, I'm very interested to hear um, certainly what other folks have to say. I see Councillor Penny Jordan's hand raised, so I'm gonna go to her next. So go ahead, Penny. Okie dokie. Um, first, I wanna say that um, I think we've all done many of us here on the council have done major projects in our lives and we've created plans that are for large implementations that take uh, multiple years and we know plans are laid out and that they change as the as you uh, uncover new information plans on static. Uh, secondly, I went to the comprehensive plan in order to prepare for on, on page 45, it talks about uh, developing strategies to start and promote small business in the town center that serve residents. I, the, as any strategy, a strategy can be um, interpreted in, uh, in a couple of different ways. Um, you can uh, interpret this that um, uh, only businesses, but what I see and how I interpret it is that we need more people in order to create that vibrant town center. Um, in addition, uh, as a person who owns a retail operation, I can tell you that retail is not easy. When we opened, uh, we own our farm stand here in Cape Elizabeth, but we also own a store in South Portland. To build out a retail store costs us over $80,000. That's before you had the first customer walk through the door. That is a large investment that you then need to hire people, pay people, et cetera. Um, and, and to have a retail operation that is uh, off the beaten path, and you may not think that 200 whatever fee is off the beaten path, but when you're trying to get customers through your door, it's off the beaten path. I truly support, and uh, you guys can tell me if I'm way off base, I truly support no retail in the first floor. Um, and I say that for many different reasons. Um, I believe that Cape Elizabeth has such income disparity that it is time for us to start looking at how we create income diversity in our community. And this is one way to start doing that. As a member of the Comprehensive Planning Committee, I will tell you the number of times that people came to meetings and said, 
We want diversity in our community. We want income diversity. We want cultural diversity. We want diversity. Then at meeting its development. Um, when I think about it, it's been 40 years since we were able to implement any affordable uh, units of any sort uh, called Colonial Village in Cape Elizabeth, that over that time, our income disparity has increased. If you go into the comprehensive plan and you look at how much the cost of housing in Cape has increased, I will tell you that there is no way that I can afford to live in the town, to buy a house in the town that I grew up in and that my family's been here for generations. This, uh, this project is designed for my demographic. It is, it, I'm older, single, uh, a single bedroom works for me. Uh, I don't need a lot of space. If you look at the comprehensive plan and you look at the number of people in town, um, well over 1,700 people who are over the uh, age of 65, you just take a percentage of that, there could be within that 10% uh, of those people that would, would jump at the chance to have a small apartment in the center of town. When I look at the population between the age of 45 and 64 who have parents who they would love to bring to town and have living in a, a, a single bedroom uh, apartment that they could be close and they could take care of their parents, et cetera, et cetera. Their parents could be somewhat independent. Uh, if you look at what the needs of the aging population the younger people, and thank you, Matt Jordan, you got a great last name. Um, when you look at what Matt put out there, that there are people who are graduating from college who would love to come back to town. Um, I think that we would be short-sighted to, to cast aside a project that can do so much for this town. And what I will say is that as a person who's elected to serve the town of Cape Elizabeth and the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, sometimes we have to make the tough decisions. I will tell you that what cluster housing was proposed uh, to develop Cross Hill, that wasn't a popular item. And that took multiple years to implement that. And the council went through a lot of trials and tribulations to get that project to happen. Floor in Cape Elizabeth. I'll never forget conversations in uh, the kitchen uh, with my dad as, when he was on the council and how controversial that was, the amount of money that was going to cost to hook up. Um, there are a lot of projects that's happened in this town that the council had to step it up and make the tough calls. And I could go on and on and on because I, I really think that this project can benefit the town of St. Elizabeth, can benefit the town center, can create a vibrant town center, can, can reinvigorate some of the businesses that we have here in town. Um, and so I know that some people have said, why would you take the first project that comes uh, in front of you? Well, I don't think we're just jumping at a project. We're we're looking at a project that can be beneficial to the town. Um, and I think we as a council need to think about what our role is and really consider what is best for the town five, 10, 15, 20 years from now, because that's what our job is. Thanks, Penny. Uh, Councilor Boucher? I just wanted to add on to what Penny said because I really digged into data and when the comprehensive plan was made, a third of the households were, you know, cost burdened and that's very clearly stated multiple times throughout the comprehensive plan. But it is based off the median home price of 2013, which was $375,000. As of January 2021, the median home price in Cape Elizabeth is $590,000. 
And I don't think any of us, um, certainly not while starting out, could afford a home where we've been living for decades. Um, I kind of fit two demographics of this project, first being the young millennial graphic who's just out of school trying to make ends meet on low income and really high rents. But also I recently had to relocate my parents from another state during the middle of a pandemic and there were no options. I had nowhere to bring them and they were high risk and having to go to work every day. And I think that's a situation that a lot of people in our town face. I have talked to numerous people who are in support of this project quietly um, and they have said the same things. They're looking to caring for their parents now or 10 years from now. They're looking for their kids who are currently in middle school or high school who want to come back. And we all know that Maine is one of the oldest states here. Um, and then there's a whole report that came from GP Cog just a month or two ago about how um, limiting our ordinances as a state, um, they analyzed from Boston up, are for affordable housing developments. And it, they weren't meant or created to be restrictive, but um, in the way they were created, they have turned out to be restrictive. And um, Cape Elizabeth had, um, I have it right here, 1%. 1% of the land has more limits than needed for affordable housing, and 81% of the land in Cape Elizabeth has too many limitations for affordable housing. So when people say, let's, let's do this somewhere else, why does it have to be town center? Um, well, 81% of the land here has many limits and 18% it's not allowed at all. So town center has the most flexible ordinances for something like this. I think we need density. And for first for retail, everyone shops online. My, my entire business is online. Um, I don't think that's a trend that's changing. I think that it was already heading there and then the pandemic accelerated it. So we're seeing that in the center of town having vacancies for the entire time I've lived here. So I'm in support of this project as it stands right now. My biggest concerns about parking and traffic. I just wanted to add uh, before calling on anybody else, um, one other thing, um, piggybacking a little bit on what both Penny and Nicole said. Um, and I had a conversation with, with Matt about this, um, you know, as we were, uh, talking about scheduling this workshop tonight um, because I, like I said in my earlier remarks, I, I, I feel like there's this um, uh, sort of tension existing where um, the, the council, at least those of us who have spoken so far, probably leaning in support of this as, as being consistent with the comprehensive plan and, and um, you know, something that has value for the community and all that kind of stuff. But what happened is that I, I think um, more as a function of, of you know the purchase and sale schedule that the seller and the developer were on here, um, you know this this sort of got put onto a, a, a track that might not have been um, the the best order of operation, if you will, in terms of aligning town and council policy with then the development of the needed ordinances and regulations to align with that. So if, if, if we step out of the, the development um, example for just a moment and look at another issue that's on our plate that we're coming to the finish line on, um, you know, we've been wrestling with short-term rental regulations and a stated policy goal of the council to update and bring you know, tighter regulation uh, to something that had been a growing and consistent concern amongst many citizens in town. And so over the course of what's now been a year and a half, basically, the, you know, the council and the ordinance committee of the council has been working on crafting uh, the appropriate solution by way of ordinance language to fit that, that problem or that challenge, and then went to the planning board to get reaction and, and, and you know, have, have their input on it, but it was something that the, the, the council had sort of led from a, from a policy and direction standpoint. Um, coming out of the 2019 comprehensive plan work, um, you know, those counselors that were, that were uh, you know, part of the council last year will remember going through the exercise where we sort of rank prioritized 
um, the different recommendations in the plan and the work associated with those and sort of looked at, you know, these are things that are maybe next one to three years, next three to five or, you know, three to six years, then six to 10 years in terms of the recommendations that are built into that plan. I think in an ideal world, um, you know, what I'm getting to is that we, we probably um, would have been in a better position, um, you know, relative to this project that's being proposed or any other potential project um, that, you know, would meet this objective or meet this goal, you know, were we in a, a, a situation where the council had sort of done that similar work and said, okay, this is our policy objective, we're going we're gonna to reframe and rewrite and, and um, rejigger our, our ordinances to invite that kind of development um, so that we achieve that objective, we achieve that goal. In this case, you have a, a, a proposal that's come forward that sort of, you know, short circuited any of that work from taking place. Um, and as is evidenced by the short term rental um, process that we've been through, which I don't, you know, I, I don't denigrate in any way. Um, but that what that's not fast, you know, as I pointed out, that's been about a year and a half. And I, I suspect that um, these developers or frankly, any others um, probably aren't interested in sitting around for a year and a half for the council, um, you know, to go through that process. So in any case, what, what I'm what I'm trying to point out is, um, you know, alignment with something that was brought up, you know, within the comprehensive plan. What I'm sensing, though, again, we haven't heard from everybody, and I do want to hear from others that, you know, especially if you have an opposing view, um, but, um, you know, some level of support um, from folks on the council um, to support that objective. Um, you know, it just so happens that there's a live ball, you know, on the field right now um, that sort of supersedes some of that other work from happening. So anyway, um, other councilors have anything that they want to add or, or thoughts that they want to share? I'll Councilor go ahead. Noonan. Oh, Councilor Devereaux, go ahead. And then Councilor nope. Noonan. Councilor Noonan can go ahead. I'll, I'll go after her. OK. Thank you. Yep. Um, I, I ordinarily try to uh, avoid being repetitive, but I think that this might be actually what Nathan's looking for tonight. So I'll just go ahead and say that I largely agree with what I heard from Penny and Nicole. And I think what I just heard from Jamie, <laughs> um, the way I interpreted it, Jamie, was you were sort of saying just because the cart accidentally got before the horse doesn't mean we should discard the whole project, which I agree with. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just because we didn't um, go through a real rigorous process to try to, as you said, invite this sort of uh, project to be brought forth doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile. So I do agree with that. Um, and I actually don't really see it being that much in opposition to the town center plan. Um, what I've read from the town center plan talked a lot more about uh, the walkability, um, having gathering places, which we now have our town green. Um, since that was done, we've also had the library renovated, which once we can get back into it, has some wonderful meeting places. Um, there really isn't that much talk in the town center plan about the commercial development. It does mention some mixed use development, but it seems like uh, the majority of that is really centered more around the walkability and the gathering places and whatnot. And I know you could say, you know, a restaurant or something is a gathering place, but we, we do have those. We have uh, a nice little sandwich shop and again, places like the library. So I don't see that we have a dearth of that. So it's, it's not a concern of mine. Um, and I certainly, I agree with what others have said, um, as Nicole mentioned, as long as I have lived here, which has been about 15 or 16 years, I've seen a lot of vacancy in in town the old key bank has been sitting there for seven years maybe um, I can't think of anything better to bring attract more commercial activity than to have another 60 or 70 um, potential customers right there in the center of town I think the best thing that could happen for I don't know what it's called but like lot one in the center the town center green there is to have 70 built-in customers right next door <laughs> So I can see <clears throat> that that would bring more interest for something like a coffee shop or a sandwich shop or a restaurant or, or who knows what. Um, and as other people have said, having it be set that far back, I can't imagine it would be a pandemic or not. Like I just don't ever see that being um, a really popular commercial area. So of all of the amendments, um, 
that I was kind of surprised with the planning board because um, that's actually the one that I have the least concern with is, is discarding that commercial requirement. So, and Jamie, I just wanted to thank you for all the time you spent on that planning board meeting. It was um, really helpful to have you there representing uh, our intentions and you did a really nice job. So, thank you. I appreciate that. I don't know if the yeah. planning board would, <laughs> would echo <laughs> that, but I thank you anyway. But, yeah. Um, and yeah, thank you for, um, distilling uh, into, you, you captured exactly what my thoughts were relative to the, the process and the sequence on this. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Council Devereaux, did you wanna weigh in? Yeah, um, I'd also wanna thank you, Jamie, for all the time you spent with the planning board. It was really helpful um, for me, hearing their questions and you chatting with them about our, um, our process. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, I'm, um, I'm not as, uh, I'm a little more concerned about the project, as you know, um, from when we talked, uh, before with Mr. Zanton and Mr. Monk, I, um, I feel like what some of the planning board members said, here we are, um, jumping through hoops for a developer to change a lot of our zoning requirements, ordinances, rather than going through a process, having input from residents, talking about what we wanna change, how we wanna change it, the way we did with the comprehensive plan. And I, I really believe that um, the comprehensive plan is a, um, a living, breathing document. So it's going to change and we do change it, we amend it. We just recently amended it. Um, so I don't see that as a problem, except it was just very, very recent. We were all sitting in meetings. There were people from the community coming to those meetings, talking about the comprehensive plan, talking about what they wanted in town center. Um, people were talking about the walkability and, and had, as Penny pointed out, the vibrancy. And Penny said, that means um, people. I don't know that everyone thought about apartments. Um, we didn't discuss that, but people talked about retail. People talked about being able to have their kids play in the village green. And now we're getting emails from people saying, I wouldn't feel comfortable bringing my kids there if there's um, a, a big apartment complex um, that really isn't um, geared toward families. So that's one of my concerns. Um, about about that. Also, um, just recently we voted uh, on allowing this project of Dr. Jacobson's. It was a four to three vote. I was one of the people that voted against it. The other two people are not on the council anymore. Um, and one of my questions was the retail with the um, living and um, that it was set so far back, but all four of you who voted for it knew it was set back, knew that there was retail and, and voted for it like that. And that was just very recent. So I'm a little um, confused as to why now you're so ready to change it when you just voted for um, that type of a development. Um, my, I guess I don't really have a big problem with whether there's retail there or not. However, I think the parking is a problem. Um, the developer has asked for five changes, maybe even six to the um, ordinance. And um, one of them is parking because they are required to have 76 spaces. I think 34 dedicated parking spots for 49 units it really is not enough, especially if, if you're talking about renting to um, people who have lived here in Cape, who have family, who have friends, people are gonna come visit. You're not even gonna have enough parking spaces for people who live there, let alone people who come visit. Where's everyone gonna park? That, that's one of my big concerns. Um, and, and I guess I can um, ask Mr. Zanton this, have you thought about um, uh, you, you talked about the problems that you would have um, 
if you put retail in the first floor and that there's really no other place to put it. But what about the gym? Could you um, take out the gym and put in apartments there? Is, is there other things you could do? Is there another way you can do parking? Um, are there other things we can do to, um, to help you? And then um, also he mentioned that this place will be for retired people, elderly people who live in Cape, but, and for teachers and farmers and fishers. Um, but are, is he giving priority to Cape residents? I don't think so. And I don't think that that's, um, maybe he is, but my guess is it's gonna be first come first serve. It's gonna be a lot of people that um, live in Cape who might wanna live there, who, who won't be able to. So uh, I don't know. I, I think that um, one of the other issues that the planning board talked about in their very first meeting was fire that the fire department requires you to be able the trucks to be able to get behind the building um, especially a building that's four stories high there's no way to do that in this plan um, so i haven't heard how they've resolved that so i'd really like to hear how they're going to resolve some of these issues and um i really do appreciate that they've made um, a few two bedroom units but right now with the um, amount of people that are against this, and I feel that a lot of people have not had their input in this, um, I, I really can't support it. Um, Nathan or Kristen, I'm not, I don't know. If there were a couple of things in there that Councilor Devereaux, I think, sort sure. of wrapped up his questions for you. I, I'm happy to give you the chance to respond to any of those if you want or not. Sure, I'll start and and, um, and then when, when I'm done, Kristen, feel free to jump in um, with other points that I may not have made. So on the with question of fire access, we did meet with the fire chief um, and it was a very good meeting and he is he is happy with the situation. He, he's, he can get at the get at the building from the front and from one of the sides. Um, and that's that's enough for him. Um, so he is he's okay with our site plan. Um, I think it's on that note. It's just so we it is a fully sprinkled building, and I think that was the biggest contributing factor as to why he was okay with the site plan the way that it is. Is that the building would be fully set up that sprinklers would go off if there was a fire. Great. In terms of um, giving priority to Cape residents. We can't legally exclude non-CAPE residents, but what we can do is affirmatively market this to CAPE residents. And that's what we would plan to do. We would you know, put up, when, when we're getting to, to the point of taking applications, we will, we will advertise it like in the CAPE Courier and nowhere else. Um, we will uh, put up signs at the IGA, um, put up signs at Sea Salt um, uh, and, and affirmatively try to reach Cape people. So, uh, and of course we'll have signs all during construction. There will be uh, signs as kind of a marketing sign at the site um, right up there at 77 saying what the, what the project is with a rendering of what it'll look like when it's done with um, some bullet points about, about some, some of the amenities there and a phone number to call if you're interested in getting on our wait list. And that of course would benefit Cape residents that. Um, much more than non-CAPE residents because CAPE residents would be driving by the site much more often than people in Portland would or, or Westbrook or some other place. Um, on the parking issue, um, we, I can't tell you how many apartment buildings, including some of ours, many of ours, have overbuilt parking. Um, it's just when I drive by any one of our apartment complexes during the day or at night, even at 9 p.m. on a Wednesday night, there's always tremendous extra parking and it, it never fails. I, the parking requirements in general, at least in Maine, are just much higher than what the real demand is. I think part of it is that um, there are elderly people who don't drive anymore and, and they either for health or safety reasons and the parking regulations don't take that into account. They assume that every single person has a car or even more than one car. Um, like here in Cape, it's 1.5 uh, 
spaces for a one bedroom. So if we're renting to an 85 year old widow who doesn't drive anymore, we'd have to, we'd have to provide one and a half parking spaces for her. Um, and, and of course she's not gonna use, use it at all. So um, the, there's, and then there, there are, uh, we, we would for a lot of, a lot of the one bedrooms would be inhabited by single people, but we'd still have to provide 1.5 spaces for that single person. They're not gonna have one and a half cars. They're only gonna have one car. So we just are very conscious about overbuilding parking. And I think that I really agree with the young man who, who called in this evening. I don't think, I wouldn't go so far as to only require us to have 34 parking spaces. I think that would be too little. But I think that if we could start with 49 or 50 and see how that goes, and we, we could agree that we would, if, if there was, if they were oversubscribed, we would build within, you know, a matter of a couple of months, additional spaces on that land behind the existing town hall parking lot. I would love that because um, I think that would give us a chance to not overbuild parking. But if the town really wants to be conservative on parking, we could build 34 additional spaces for a total of 68 spaces. And I guarantee you that there will be extra spaces we, that our, our residents would not use all 68. And we would have extra spaces to give to people coming to the town hall for, for town meetings and things. If God okay. wills, we're able to get back to in-person meetings. Well, my, my other question about that leads to, um, we're talking about um, our climate goals for the town and we're talking about um, solar, we're talking about charging stations for cars. None of these people are gonna have garages. They're, some of them are not gonna have dedicated parking spots. What are you doing for um, solar charging for um, cars if someone decides we're really moving that way. But yes. I don't see anything in your plan for that. I think we haven't gotten to that level of detail yet, Councillor Devereaux, but I think that um, certainly if that was important to the to the town council, and we we might very well do it for our own reasons. I know we're we're working on a project in Old Orchard Beach right now, which is going to begin construction about the end of August of, of this year. And we are putting in a number of, of spaces which are going to be ready to receive electric vehicle charging stations. Um, we're not certain yet whether we're actually gonna put the stations in, but we, we will get to the, they'll have all the infrastructure there so that if there's demand for them among our residents, we can easily put them in. And I think that that's likely what we would do in Cape as well, because there's no question that, that um, cars are, are totally moving in the electric vehicle direction. And in, in 10 years, um, we will see so many more electric vehicles than we see now. So we need to be ready for that. All right, thank you. Councilor Gaberson. Oh no, I was just revising the estimate down from 10 years to two years. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were signaling that you wanted to speak. Um, Councilor Deborah, the, the, the one thing I just wanted to you know, respond to one of the things that you mentioned about, and it, 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 I think really the, the sort of most central to the viability of the project is the, the first floor commercial space. And um, you know, it's it's interesting. We we keep hearing the phrase commercial and retail being used somewhat interchangeably here, and and I for one actually draw a little bit more of a, a finesse distinction between the two because um, I think has been pointed out, um, you know, for for retail, um, you, you know, we're seeing a a growing trend and a and consistent data that supports. The struggle that it is to to you know develop retail space. Um, Cape Cape Elizabeth certainly does have you know commercial enterprises, um, but uh, you know a lot of the businesses are not the type that necessarily are the ones that are drawing that foot traffic um, that is consistent with um, you know the type of a uh, uh, vision that's laid out in the town center plan. And then the other thing that really for me is the biggest thing. And I think as a function of this, I'm, I'm not sure whether this development moves forward or not. You know, this has caused me to think quite a lot about the town center plan and whether or not there are things within that plan that are just frankly out of sync and out of date with, again, I, as I said at the outset, sort of the reality of the marketplace, right? I mean, you know, Cape is a geographically uh, you know, somewhat isolated location where, you know, it's not like there's a lot of 
folks like you have in Falmouth on Route 1 or Scarborough on Route 1, where there's, you know, in normal times, consistent vehicular traffic of people getting from home to work or, you know, things like that. I mean, you, you have to be pretty intentional about coming to Cape to frequent one of our businesses. Mm -hmm. um, or you live here and you're supporting it because you're already here. But it's not the same kind of sort of transient customer base that travels through. I uh, would say for a couple of weeks in the summertime when you've got people maybe heading down to Kettle Cove or Crescent Beach and things like that. So um, I think it's very difficult. Um, my view is that it's very difficult to achieve the vision that's laid out in the town center plan um, in any meaningful way, just based on, you know, the function of the market um, and, 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 you know, consumer demands and, and things like that. And so if, if, if that vision can't be realized, I, I'm not sure how valuable it is to the community to keep clinging to this plan and, you know, potentially denying developments, whether it be this one or any number of others, or frankly, ones that have been developed, but have had to make a whole bunch of accommodation, because again, we're, we're trying to hold them to this, you know, this model that in my view is, is somewhat broken. Um, and again, this gets back to the whole cart before the horse thing. Well, you know, maybe that, that's a discussion we should have had, you know, six months, a year ago, what have you, but that's not where we are right now. And so, you know, we're kind of having to be put in the position of, of walking and chewing gum at the same time of thinking, well, you know, you know, how can, you know, how can we take this opportunity that's before us and maybe move it forward in a way that better aligns with where we think that that, you know, that plan or that vision might adapt to. Um, so I don't see it as bending to the will of the developer so much as I see, you know, the, the track record and, and the, 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 you know, the, the reality of the absolute lack of development that's happened in the town center since the town center plan was adopted and the frequent turnover in a number of the existing resale spaces and commercial spaces that are there now to me say, hey, you know, not to denigrate the work that went into that plan whatsoever. And I know people put in a lot of time and, you know, a, a lot of effort and there were resources that were put towards that. But the facts bear out that, you know, that vision hasn't been realized. So either, either it's a, you know, a faulty plan or something else, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure how we keep, you know, holding it up as the holy grail um, and, and not having results that, you know, that bear that out. So, Jeremy, now you now your hand raised. Yeah, um, thanks, Jamie, for articulating that. And, you know, I, I just want to start off by saying I agree with the, you know, every, pretty much everything that Penny, Nicole, and, and Gretchen said earlier. But, you know, I, I think rather than thinking about it uh, as, as a faulty plan, I, I think the way that I'm thinking about it is, is just that the commercial reality has changed. Um, and, you know, I it's the timing of this for me, the part of it that's unfortunate is it, it's, it's hard to know as we're just coming out of this pandemic where that's gonna land. Um, I know there are a number of communities nearby who are talking about well, how to, or looking at provisions for how you can you know, think about converting some of that unused or underutilized commercial space in the greater Portland area back into residential uses and what types of ordinances need to be, changes need to be made to support that. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I would be really interested to have helping us move forward um, with, with thinking through this is, you know, sending this package of, of concepts along to the ordinance committee to really help us think that through. And I think that's not just the zoning amendments that are needed in the town center district, but also the TIF um, package amendments uh, and my, I, I guess what I would like to do is look at those in a way that, that asks, how can we, what do we need to do to make not just a project like this work, but to make those um, zoning amendments work for, you know, other projects that are going to be coming into town center, whether it's the parcel next to town hall or potential redevelopment at some point of the, you know, the, the IGA uh, you know, shopping plaza, you know, businesses in there. Um, I, I think that's the context where 
I'm interested in having those conversations around, you know, what do, what do we, what do we need to be doing to think about how our ordinances do, don't currently support the type of, of development that, you know, we would like to see in the town. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, you um, referenced uh, in, in your comment there, the TIF. I do want to talk about that for just a second too. Um, number one, you know, certainly very uh, obviously enthusiastic about um, uh, the change in the percentage uh, as it obviously benefits the town. Um, so that's, you know, good news for this to move forward. My question to Nathan as he was presenting on that was obviously a leading one based on based on my opinion on this but what I want to be clear from my personal opinion too is that um, I know that I know that tiffs draw a lot of um, sort of pointed perspectives and, and, and sometimes critiques um, and in my view this is exactly the type of project that tiffs were created for in the first place and unfortunately I think in a lot of other communities and a lot of other developments tiffs have been Sort of misapplied and misappropriated, um, you know, basically, you know, to be used as leverage to pit communities against one another for the developer to try and extract the greatest potential value, you know, out of the community. And, and you think about, you know, large corporations, you know, in Southern Maine. I'm not going to, you know, you know, call them out by name, but most of us can probably recognize in the past few years in communities like Westbrook and Scarborough and Freeport, uh, you know, a number of instances where. Um, TIFs were used, you know, effectively as a means to retain the company or attract a company to move to a community um, because of whatever value or cachet, um, you know, associates with that. And, and, and to me, that's very, very different than what we're talking about here. And, and the fact that um, the, the revenue being returned to the development is staying within the development and the development has a long-term benefit, in my view, for the community. Uh, it, you know, I'm I'm very comfortable, and I think that that is extremely consistent with what TIFs were um, envisioned for in terms of community development work to begin with, versus um, just corporate handouts um, to try and attract, you know, large name marquee corporations um, that probably, you know, more than have the means um, to be able to do the development. Um, without those things. So Jeremy, your hand's going back up. I gather you want to respond to that. Yeah, no, I just wanted to chime in quickly and say, um, I, I agree with that, um, everything you just said, Jamie. I, I think um, I would encourage us to adopt, a, you know, and I'd, I'd like to learn more about this. I, you know, there's a lot I don't know about TIFFs, I'll admit that readily up front, um, but I would um, encourage us to look at this from a perspective of developing, um, rather than amending our current TIF, of looking at developing some sort of an affordable housing TIF. I think the issues uh, around affordable housing that this project addresses and has raised in our community go beyond this single project. And if there's a way for us to think about structuring that TIF so that uh, you know, the portion of revenue that's retained by the town and the TIF district can be used to support other affordable housing needs, whether that's additional projects or, you know, other, other I guess, um, strategies and policies that would help address the, the affordability, housing affordability issue in town. Um, I think that'd be a, a policy direction I'd be interested in pursuing. Um, thoughts from any other counselors that want to respond, weigh in, offer other viewpoints? Caitlin? I don't have many other viewpoints, but um, I agree more with what Valerie was saying. Um, you know, I'm just not 100% on board with moving forward with how it is set now. I don't like having to make all the changes around one development. I would have rather brainstorm and see what changes came about rather than make changes because somebody asked for them. So my position right now is not 100% sold. Thanks, Caitlin.
Go ahead, Councilor Newman. Yep. Oh. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that, but I, I was expressing support for eliminating the commercial um, since that seemed to be the thing that Nathan was most interested in hearing about tonight. I certainly have other questions around the footprint and whatnot, but, um, and I'm, as Caitlin and Valerie both said, not necessarily 100% sold. We haven't gone through the process yet. We haven't heard enough from the public yet. Um, but just in terms of the commercial, I think I've definitely seen and heard enough and learned enough to know that um, that I'm pretty comfortable with that uh, amendment, but certainly I wanna go through the entire process to make decisions about some of these other issues. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, I'll take that opportunity too, Councilman Noonan, um, to just clarify that, that we're not approving moving forward with the project tonight. This is a workshop, we're not voting on anything. Um, there is still, as I alluded to earlier, a public hearing that the planning board will host um, coming up uh, in, in a week, about a week and a half's time. Um, so there is still more of this process to unfold. Uh, obviously, um, you, you know, I think as, as you know, somebody alluded to earlier, ultimately we'll be the ones, you know, having to vote on these things that come, come back. Um, but uh, so, I, you know, I think it's important for us to be engaged and, and signaling where we stand on things, but, um, you know, nothing that's being offered up today, uh, obviously is, is either, you know, written in stone or, um, like I said, or is it anything that we're actually voting on? Um, you know, to, to that end, I, I you know, I, I do, um, have a little bit of question about, um, the parking plan um, and, and things like that. Um, it's from a natural bias of mine based on a spouse who <laughs> works in that profession. So <laughs> I probably uh, know a little bit en enough to be dangerous on that. But um, so um, anyway, uh, that's something that, you know, I just, I would want to dig into a little bit more. I, I agree generally with some of the points you're making about some of your other developments, Nathan. I think this is so unique. Again, speaking to that geographic sort of isolation compared to some other communities where maybe you've had development projects and the, and the current lack of a public transportation option where only ride share is basically the only other, um, you know, means if you don't have your own vehicle. Um, I, I wholly hope that if this was to move forward that, you know, many of the people that would be occupants would, would be walking about or biking about in, in, in the town center area, but I think it's still a pre pretty realistic um, necessity um, living, living in Cape that you have at least one vehicle if you're able to drive and so on. So, um, and then the other thing that I think about, depending on the demographic that fills the, the building is whether or not you have, um, uh, you know, service professionals that are gonna be calling on those folks on a regular basis and, and, and have a need of, of temporary parking. So, um, you know, I think of, you know, home healthcare aides and, and, and folks like that, um, that, um, you know, maybe coming and going quite frequently and, and making sure that that's accounted for. So even though the number of occupants and residents might not equal the 1.5, um, the, the, the overall parking burden of, of the tenant, you know, has to be, I think, factored into there as well. So um, anyway, we, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole tonight. We're not, we're not you know, um, getting into that level of detail uh, in this discussion, but um, so anyway, um, other input, other thoughts before we kind of wrap up. I, 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 I don't know, Matt. I, I know I, I'm pretty sure I saw Maureen as one of the listed participants. I, I don't know, you know, how any of this sort of relays back to the planning board and factors into any you know decisions that they they're continuing to contemplate. I I gather both Nathan and Kristen and 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 Robert that you've sort of gotten the, the sense that I think you were hoping to get a sense of from, um, yes. you, know, it, it, you, you know, I'm based on my count, sensing some level of majority support on the part of the council for uh, most, if not all of the proposed amendments. Um, but, um, you know, again, that's not something we're, you know, formally or finally decisioning on tonight. So, um, Go ahead, Matt. Do you want to weigh in? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I think uh, you and I are of the same mind. Uh, I think this would be helpful for the planning board. Uh, we do have this on video, and, and Maureen is here this evening. So uh, if there 
are questions that people would like to come back to circle back and see what direction the council is leaning in, then they can, this will be a very, I, I think, helpful uh, meeting to have provided information to the planning board as they go forward in their deliberations on the 20th. Uh, specific to that one policy question, that seems to be uh, the area of, of, of greatest consternation at the planning board level. Uh, and then, uh, but I think, you know, this was, this was timely uh, for sure, so they can provide that guidance and uh, as well as to, as well as to Mr. Zen and his associates to uh, see where the council is now, because uh, as you so accurately stated at the beginning with the compressed, uh, a compressed window for decision-making process, uh, I think the council and the planning board and the developers are all working uh, as best as they can to come forward with a resolution or at least a, a, a decision tree that can be can be fully leaved out uh, in order to, to get to the point where they need to be able to make their decision as well as the town can, can come forward with this decision process. So very productive. Uh, I, I would walk away from this be, being optimistic. Yeah, I, I want one more thing. Thanks, Matt. One more thing I just wanted to add in to a, a little bit of a response to both Caitlin and, and Valerie concerns that you've raised, which I think are, are totally legitimate and ones that I certainly have as well, where, you know, whether whether in in reality or just even in appearance, you know these actions are, are seen as as you know in response to a specific development proposal or in response to the requests of an individual developer. I, I get that, and I I think that that's certainly a valid point to be raised and to be considered, and and as a as a general matter of practice, not one that we should be sort of in the habit of of where people just come and make requests or, or, you know, demands to change the rules. And, and we just, you know, are, are being so flexible that what's, what's the point of having, you know, having those regulations in place to begin with. What I've kind of looked at in this particular case is whether there was an active proposal in front of us or not, would we not get to the same potential outcome regardless? So yes, it may be the fact that this development and this developer have, have, been the catalyst to raise the questions around these particular um, needs or requirements in order to have a viable development. Everything I can gather seems like whether it's this development or something else, we're probably going to be having to make a lot of these same adjustments if we want anything in place, um, you know, there generally. So um, I, I I get the the optics can be concerning for folks, and and that's certainly some of the criticism we've heard, or some of the opposition that has been pointed towards us. Of, you know, wh why are you just sort of, you know, bending over backwards in 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 the words of some other folks, um, you know, to to make these accommodations, and and part of my response is, would we not potentially reach the same conclusion and same actual outcome regardless? Um, if we were to be pursuing any other proposal that might be coming before us. So um, anyway, it, it, uh, go ahead, Mr. Zan. Just, just to build on that very, very quickly, I think that what, what we're doing by proposing this project, we're really kind of illuminating the fact that the current zoning, at least in the town center, does not allow for affordable housing. I don't think any other developer would be able to do a successful project with this current zoning regime in place. So we're really kind of prompting a conversation amongst the town fathers and mothers about, is that a state of affairs that we want to continue? Um, because I don't think you'll see any affordable housing development in town unless there's change in the zoning. Um, any other thoughts from anybody else before we um, I don't know if there's anybody, um, as we do have people, if, if there's anybody who hadn't spoken earlier from the public, uh, we've got about 10 folks left. If there's anybody remaining with us that wants to weigh in since we have you here, I'm happy to take any additional comment. Not seeing any hands go up. Anybody else from the council last chance for tonight? Okay. Um, well, thank you uh, to the members of the public who um, offered their comments, um, you know, to folks who have emailed us. We appreciate your input um, by that um, channel as well. You're welcome to continue to email us. 
Um, Matt, remind me, what when is the date of the planning board meeting? April 20th, Mr. Chairman. April 20th. So if, if you uh, would like to participate in that, um, that'll be held obviously by Zoom as well. So, um, you know, please feel free to either um, direct your comments uh, by email to the planning board or uh, log on to that meeting to participate. Um, and I want to thank uh, Kristen and Nathan and, and Robert for um, and, and, uh, you know the, the work that you put in on uh, you know updating the presentation and, and informing the council, uh, answering the questions that um, were, were put to you tonight. Appreciate that. Um, hopefully, this has um, you know provided you with, like I said, the direction um, that you were seeking. Um, and, and, and hopefully this will be valuable for the planning board um, as they continue to consider this as well. So thank you very much for uh, having us tonight and for giving us a couple of hours of all of your time. We appreciate it. Sure thing. Okay. Um, the next regular council meeting is Monday night, uh, the 12th. So uh, we'll have plenty of other things to talk about then. But until then, thank you, everybody, and have a good evening. Good night. Good night.